Conference Psychodynamics 101 says that everybody is extremely energetic right before lunch, about lunch, and less energetic after lunch because of lunch. Uh, but, but the way to deal with that is to put the really most intellectually complicated and exciting stuff directly after lunch and force people to rise to the occasion, which I now propose to do. Um, we have um, uh, had a couple of themes that we have tried to pursue across years uh, in the last couple. Uh, I'm giving Jeremiah and the subject of cars a rest until next year, by which time it will be ready again for some more careful work. And as everybody knows, I keep waiting for the hype about machine learning to reduce itself to the point at which we can have an actual conversation about the interesting subjects of licensing and machine learning that we're not ready to get to yet. Uh, although I do want to spend a brief moment on open data licensing later in the afternoon. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the other subject which has uh, crossed latitudinally our uh, screens from year to year has been about fintech, um, where too I have sometimes had to wait for a blast of hype to pass by in order to resume. Um, but but uh, one of the reasons that this is such a problem uh, is that people talk about things all the time without the slightest technological understanding. Uh, as a result of which very crazy ideas like, oh, smart contracts, that replaces contract law tomorrow, and other weird ideas have, have you know, just sort of taken over because nobody was really talking tech. They were all just talking buzzword compliance about tech. Uh, and so what we have tried to do uh, is to settle into fintech subjects here in places where we could offer uh, both corrective technological specificity and also uh, some larger social context. Um, therefore, of course, uh, my view is technical presentations should be given by historians, political scientists, economists, and other people who, if they know the tech, also know something else. Uh, this afternoon's uh, uh, keynote speaker, Professor Sharon O'Halloran, fits exactly uh, that uh, recipe on our parts, that we should learn our technology from people who know a hell of a lot of that and also uh, all the other things as well. Uh, professor O'Halloran is the George Blumenthal Professor of Political Economy uh, and Professor of International Public Affairs at Columbia University. She comes uh, to her deep technological understanding in the correct way as a social scientist trying to find out how to use quantitative methods and other technology in order really to understand the world. Um, and is now uh, the director of the FinTech Lab and the right person to talk uh, at precisely the level that we need. Um, uh, Professor O'Halloran is a, a, a person who has given uh, uh, of herself largely to university governance as well as a refugee from university senate affairs, which once upon a time I uh, also buried myself deep into until I was forced out again. Uh, I am deeply respectful of her ability to uh, chair the Senate Executive Committee and actually provide some form of vestigial faculty governance to Columbia University. You don't care about that um, because you don't have to live here. Uh, but I do because university citizenship is a dying art in the 21st century and it's a pleasure to work with a colleague who cares as much about it as I used to before I gave up. Um, uh, I, I won't, uh, I, I, I won't uh, list Professor O'Halloran's publications that for any professional academic social scientist would be a lengthy activity. Um, I, I won't even uh, say that you're going to get all the sites here today that we will provide you. When you come back uh, to the website to look at the video, which I hope you will do many a time, you will find more uh, of Professor O'Halloran's publications and the activities of the FinTech Lab there. Um, but, um, but, but for now, it is sufficient to say uh, that Professor O'Halloran is in a position to offer us what I think we most want, which is a way of talking about uh, both uh, the technology of uh, FOSS in FinTech risk analysis and uh, to provide a sense of the policy environment within which uh, that work goes on. Uh, afterwards, uh, though my dear client Jim Jagielski of the Apache Software Foundation has done what my clients always do, namely to leave me in the lurch, 
uh, Jim is dealing with a family emergency, which is a far better reason for leaving me in the lurch than my clients usually provide. Uh, but because Jim is uh, not available, um, uh, we will uh, uh, then move from Professor O'Halloran's uh, presentation to the presentation by Vipin Bharatan, which I will introduce uh, in due course. Uh, Professor O'Halloran. So uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I think it's just outlasting everyone. If it's, it's faculty government, it's just, just endurance. I run marathons, so that's basically the mentality that one takes on with these things. So uh, you don't have to run very fast, you just have to keep running, and that's it. So what I want to do then is, one, thank everyone for being here. I think this is a very extraordinary group. It's an intersection of technologists and lawyers and people that have a real interest in understanding the way technology has implications for society, for the way we do business, and for the way we're going to be doing business and interacting in the future. And I think understanding open source, the fintech, how it interacts with the public, the private, and the research sectors are going to be really important for us to come to grips with. Now, I, um, I'm really delighted to be here to present what the Columbia University's FinTech Lab has been doing. And the FinTech Lab is lodged within Columbia University's Data Science Institute. And it's one of the largest institutes addressing data science, and it's now the Na National Science Foundation's Northeastern Hub for data science. And so it's a very much of a growing part of Columbia, but it's also a growing part of academics and the way academics sees research going forward, not only in engineering and computer science and statistics, but also in the social sciences and growing in the humanities and law. So this is an important part for us to develop tools and to think systematically about this. So today what I want to do is focus on one particular part and the, of the FinTech Lab, and this is a a, a sort of a demo that we've done, and looking at the role that open source technology in particular, open source technology that addresses financial risk analytics, that is an open source financial risk engine, how that can be used, and what we'll think about is almost democratizing the way in which risk analytics can be done by financial institutions, financial institutions of all size. At the, system, at the local levels of the way institutions do it, but also in our extensions and some of the research that we've done in building out systemic levels. And then being using these tools to be able to be a means by which we'll be able to test the implications of different regulations on industries, a firm, and the system before we actually have to go ahead and blow up the actual system with a, with a regulation. So this will give us, a, if you will, a stress test of different regulations and an environment which in which to do this. So that's the general thing. So I just want to, first of all, start off with a motivation. Why would an academic institution enter into this space? And clearly, as a political economist, I'm going to talk about solving a public goods, right? We solve public goods problems. It's an area where both governments and markets have failed. And it's an area, specific area where academics can solve a problem uniquely so and in bringing together its, its expertise to this area. We're going to present a, I want to present a particular approach to solving this problem. And it's a, pro it's a way that looks at open source risk models and data visualization tools. And the goal is to make it highly accessible to industry participants, to regulators and researchers. And what we see is that there's an extraordinary asymmetry of knowledge and capabilities throughout the industry that makes it actually very difficult to have uh, what we would call a concrete or really smart sets of regulatory structures moving forward. And I think this is part of the problem of when we see these ups and downs of regulations and whether we have good or bad or more or less regulations, that's really not the conversation. It's whether we should have what's the right type of regulations under the right type of circumstances. And we need to have tools to be able to evaluate those. This then also understanding that um, we want it to be uh, cloud-based, 
We want it to be um, a means by which it's very, you can display the data. We want to have a means of aggregation, easy, drop down, drill down, all of those very simple things. It's really easy to make hard problems hard. It's very hard to make hard problems simple. And so what I want to show is a very simple way to present the information in a very infographic type of display. Now, and I'm not going to present here today, but we've also gone ahead and shown how this enterprise risk management system, if, which starts with the firm and builds up, which is really just a production process of a firm, of a financial institution, how it can also be used for systemic risk. I'll put both the presentation and papers on uh, the, the website so you can take a look at that. And then we'll just talk about what some of the next steps might be in building out a community of researchers and with par industry participants as well as regulators in thinking about some of these different types of approaches, not only developing the technology, but also developing a variety of different metrics that will enable many of the financial participants to become part of the community that's based on these open source technologies. So I, I could just lay this, put this out into the, the structure of what we all know in the context. We can all go back. This is going to be almost 10 years in next year of the financial crisis, right? We're going to have a conference on 10 years after the financial crisis in December because it's 2018 to get the edited volume out. And I just, and you're like, we're still doing it, right? <laughs> we still haven't implemented all the regs and now we're unwinding the regs. And we, and we can go back and there's still all these debates about who the culprits were. Now, everybody played a role in this. But one of the things that we've, we can really say is that government played a, a, a large part in understanding or failing to really respond to the different pressures that we saw within, within the, the system. And, and what we saw then in response to the crisis was that government introduced a number of regulations. And the regulations were really focused on reducing risk at the, in, the, in the financial markets, but really at the institutional level. The focus was on safety and soundness of the institutions, such as capital buffers, leverage re requirements, restrictions on derivatives, consumer protection, and so forth. Okay. And the question that we think about then is, is the financial system more transparent today? Is it more sound today than before the 2008 crisis? And some people argue yes, some people argue no. But one thing that we can think about is, and ask a different type, change that question a little bit, is ask, is the way in which we analyze risk, the way in which we measure risk, the metrics and the tools that we use to assess risk, is it really allowed us to be able to, ha to have a more transparent method, a more accountable method for all the participants within that? That includes the firms, that includes the regulators, and so on. And those are the types of questions that are really necessary to understand if, in fact, these have been the appropriate regulations to get out what really were the heart of the problems. Now, what we know is that the industry's response has really been to build very much of these proprietary black box risk models. They, of course, all my dear friends who are in the banks would argue very strenuously that they are completely compliant, and they are, and that they are out there doing more, uh, you, know, a, you know, giving all their data and everything, and they are, than before. But the way in which it's done is very much in these silo developments. It's very much in a way in which you really can't understand the models in which they're built out, and you really don't expose, expose what is the underlying structure. But the heart of those regulations within the Dodd-Frank and, and in some of the rules that we've seen, and even some of the rules that we're now unwinding, is that it requires transparency and a flexible analytics, right? And we saw this both in the G20, the Basel requirements, we saw this in uh, a lot of the other rules that came, that came forward, whether it be the vocal rule and so forth. Now, this is exactly what we're seeing in some of the emerging technologies that are taking place. That, in fact, this is exactly where I think um, the technologies of natural language processing, machine learning, the deep learning, the neural nets, are really being able to fill in some of these gaps. And the key 
These are becoming key tools within the solution space, and these are much, much more powerful tools than just those proprietary algorithms and models, financial models that are built uh, in the, in, within the firms. And these are models, the way in which these models, the way in which these technologies are built, are done in a very different way than just based on sort of that siloed approach, where each firm competes within the competitive advantage of their own model building. Really, it's done through a collaborative approach between academia, industry, and regulators. And that really leads us to think about not only the technology in a very different way, but all, and what the technology is, but also how we use the technology, how we build out best practices, and then how we understand the technology will be able to evolve over time. And we're seeing this, some of it developing already within the collaborative enterprises of like ArcadiaSoft, where it's a, it's a consortium between the large banks in developing some of the initial margins. And they're having to pull some of the data and come up with different types of coherent and common rules to be able to do so. So our approach then builds off of this. It's really to have develop a, a risk dashboard with an open source risk engine. Again, it's going to be cloud hosted, risk analytic models. It'll be built based on data visualization tools. It's going to allow in this particular embodiment of it, allow, allow for risk analytics. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. That's right. Sorry. If it's if you if you can't hear me or, okay, all right. Allow for risk analytics at both, at both the portfolio, asset class, and counterparty levels. And again, the features are going to be open source, collaborative, and really shared standards. And this is important because it allows you then to start coming up with a, sta a statement about what are best practices for understanding risk analytics what are best practices for understanding how one wants to measure risk under, and what are the types of, of different regulations and what are their impacts on different types of, um, on just different types of scenarios that we might see both at the firm level and aggregating up to the systemic risk level. Okay, so the open source risk engine, right, it's, it's uh, again, it's open source software it, perfor it performs complex risk calculations, as you might anticipate. It replicates a production system of a bank, right? So it's a soup to nuts. It starts with each of the trades. It builds all up to each of the, to each of the reporting outcomes that a bank has to produce. It can compute things such as a bank's counterparty credit risk, it then, and that would be, say, the risk that a bank suffers due to the default of a counterparty. And the purpose, then, is really to serve as an independent benchmarking for modeling risk analytics to improve the transparency in banking and financial services and connect academic and practitioners and aspire ideas, collaborations around the development of soft, uh, open source software. Now, What's the data flow structure of this? So this is all built out on um, C++ code. It's built off of the quant libs, uh, all of their financial model analytics. So it, this is what the basic software is. It's based off of 400,000 lines of C++. So you can go into the, onto the FinTech lab, FinTech lab, go ahead, get the demo, download it, Knock yourself out with the 400,000 lines. Um, you can, the way it, just, just to understand the way it flows, is that it, you input your data, whatever your data is, both the trade and market data and any particular configuration that you have, a particular portfolio, or whatever the algorithm or mar model that you are doing it. And then you're going to produce a series of different types of reports both net present value as in cash flow report or in the aggregating different types of exposures, say in exposure reports uh, that you'll get. And these will come out in, an, in a cube. And then from that, we roll up into the data visualization. All right, so just to give you a sense of, 
of what that might look like. This is just your uh, data input, just because we have computer science people, so we have to, you know, give you code. Right? Okay. okay, so now you feel good. Okay, good. All right, so here's some code. <laughs> Then we're going to, um, then you just run the, the kickoff on it, and then you can just see that we're just going to run out of algorithms, and the algorithms are just basically, this is just the structural models within each of the pricing models, and these are, again, very straight up, uh, the, you know, interest rate forward models, they'll include G and P, all the different types of models that you would anticipate in doing any of these forecasting ones. There's a very large volume, about 400 pages. You're, again, we'll go ahead. You can read it to your heart's delight on figuring out exactly what each of those modeling, modeling assumptions are. But the important thing is that you can actually see what the underlying assumptions are in each of these models, what the data structure is, right? It's, and if you don't like those assumptions, you can actually change those assumptions, or you can change the algorithmic structure, or you can see how that varies. Also, you can have conversations, and this is really important, with your regulators when you write about and benchmarking as to what, how, say, their results when they're doing stress tests and you're doing, you're reproducing your results, they say three, you say six, or vice versa, you actually can understand under why you're coming up with different results. It's based on a set of assumptions that you're each of you are making. And here you can actually understand that without actually exposing your own underlying model. So these are, these are really interesting ways for us to start thinking about benchmarking, having conversations with regulators that are more transparent and accountable, and getting to a heart of what a community of a best standard might look like when we're thinking about financial risk analytics in the financial sector. Nonetheless, this all produces a net ve um, present value cube that gets put out. And this case is just a CSV. Again, these are just these are just the ways in which it can it can come out in any different types of structures and formats. And then from this, you can produce out from the forecast a series of Monte Carlo simulations. And the open source risk engine, it's just a, really what these are. Just the they just project the values of each of the trays i into the future, some point t on the time grid using, again, these, these algorithmic structures. And the outcomes are just n representative future possibilities uh, for the value of the trade i and time t, given a scenario uh, of w. And here, these are just five different alternative scenarios that you're seeing here. Uh, and you, the, there's a lots of different ways in which you calculate what's going to be seen as each of the risk analytics. Uh, sometimes people average those scenarios. Some In the United States, we use CIGAR, which is sort of the extreme values of those scenarios. In any case, what you can see is what are the assumptions underlying the different types of, of risk exposure metrics that get produced. And these are the types of rollouts that you can see that all firms are required to report for regulators. Now, this is important. This actually is very difficult for firms to do. All right, this soup to nuts estimates are really hard for small and medium sized firms to actually calculate and have the capacity to do. In fact, now regulators are even asking $100 million green banks to produce these types of calculations. So the capacity to be able to go on the FinTech lab, download uh, an existing program that allows you to do that, tweak it to include your own data, then go ahead and be able to produce those, you get you about 80% of where you need to be to be able to report those out. And that's, that's quite significant for, for some of these small and medium-sized firms. In many ways, this allows us to democratize, if you will, risk analytics. Not that we're all gonna have our own risk analytics, you know, in our helm, but maybe someday. I want to do this for a watch, and you'll see how this is going to be, an, an app for Apple Watch. You, you laugh, right? OK, so there's, there's always hope. Financial risk, so there's a doubt. So again, like I was saying, it's easy to make hard things hard, hard to make hard things simple. So I really want to make, this is very simple. But it's all—it's—it's it's very hard to display and very hard to 
visualize risk in a way that's very intu it's intuitive to many people, people say who are non-experts and so forth. So, given this, you can this is just a this is just a, a series of time series of point in time and sort of breakdowns, drill down, drop down types of ways in which you can cut through the data without having a lot of data management or expertise, if you will. So total exposures, this is just interest rate, interest rate forwards of what these are done. And you can just see these going through time for total exposures. Exposure profiles are just, again, what happens with the interest rates over time and going forward. There's the, a risk gauge that shows you where, how much you're at the, they say if you set a limit, it says how much are you at, at your limit, to what extent are you in breach. You can break this down into different types of um, ratings and so forth. And uh, it gives you a sense on how you can look at your data and how you can classify the different data, both at the trade, the netting set, and the counterparty levels, okay? So when setting limits, for example, if you set for total exposures, you want to have, say, a limit of $70 million. This is just arbitrarily set. You, oops, you set it there. You can ask at what, you know, are, under what conditions are you breaching, right? So before you, this would show you in this case that when you're breaching, and this is actually really important because many of the risk officers, chief risk officers, tend to be lawyers. And while they're very in smart, and they have good senses for what matters and compliance and so forth, the laws, it's very hard for them to understand the numbers and when the numbers are actually saying whether you're in or out of compliance. So having something like as simple as a you are in breach, and this is where I want the Apple Watch to say you, you know, pops up, you know, you're in breach, you haven't done your 10,000 steps today, whatever that is. This was actually, or you have to call in and pay attention to this. This is actually something that's important. It's not that it's gonna give you the answer, but it's gonna ask some of the decision makers to ask more questions. And that's actually hard to know when it's important for you to understand that, this is an, that these particular numbers have significance for the way in which a very complex, large organization that is driven by thousands and thousands and thousands or millions and millions of trades, right? Okay, so this is just one way to summarize it. And the other point that you can do within the, again, you can go on the, this is just snapshots, so you can go on the FinTech Lab and you can doodle, noodle around in it. There's even videos to go through it. Um, you can do a, an, a, a report that shows you which trades in particular are in breach. And that's actually important because when you go into breach, you actually, with, by the end of the day, have to show or have to report those, and you have to tell your compliance officers how you're going, your regulators, how you're going to get back into compliance. And so being able to identify which of the trades that you're gonna be able to move out of in a very quick way without actually having to go back to, this is something that anybody can do it there on their desktop, that's actually something that's very powerful and that gives decision makers real tools to start asking questions and understanding how to solve those problems in a very meaningful way. Uh, also, you can, just at the fingertips, and again, not understanding a lot of detailed data management tools or queries and S MySQL, NoSQL, what have you, you can start looking at some drill down points both in the high, the way the, the data is structured is just in a hierarchical way, and here it's just done by trades, counter, uh, counter, uh, counterparties, netting sets, okay? And you can um, arrange these however you really want. And then you can just see here the, the drill downs, just in the, this is the analytical hierarchy. It doesn't require it to be this way, but it does require some analytical hierarchy, obviously, and relational re relationship when you get down to using the the infographic level of the data visualization tools. And then, again, on the risk dashboard, it just will just show you the different types of ways to present the data, either the time series with the total exposures, as we showed before, the simulation of future exposures, 
right, which are just giving you the time trends, the point in time, which are both the bar, the bar and the donuts, and then again, the drop down, drill down capabilities that get you down to very micro level data that we can show you exactly which particular trade could have let you go into a breach. And that's an important, for example, if JP Morgan actually had been able to do that like that at the desk, they would have been able to see exactly those trades that were putting them into that large breach right there and then. And that's actually very powerful to be able to state because that was one of the problems they could never figure out whether it was purposefully or what have you. I'm not going there. But it was hard to figure out exactly what that, where, where that was taking place. And this is a tool that enables you to do that. So what are the next steps? Again, uh, this is an important environment. It's an important environment like for, for a variety of reasons. Not only once you've done this, has it allowed you to start thinking about your risk analytics in a, in a different way than people had really done so before. It provides a framework that allows you to start conducting scenario tests on the impacts of alternative financial regulations, that what they'll have on financial institutions and ultimately on the financial system as a whole. Um, and further, furthermore, it's a means to democratize risk analytics and to make these tools available, readily accessible to small and medium-sized firms as they have to calculate out increasingly large number of reports for regulators. And as you, many of you would know, these are very expensive systems to put through. And uh, I think that this is some of really important things that we need to, to think about because we also need to realize that the financial institutions, they can no longer compete on their models. Why they all want to still, when you go in and get, when I give these talks to the banks, all of the large banks, they all get very nervous because they, because I keep explaining to them, that's not your comparative advantage anymore. You're not going to beat me. I'm giving away this for free. Right? And so that gets them really nervous. But I said, that's okay because your comparative advantage has shifted to where your comparative advantage should have always been, which is your strategic allocation of resources and your ability to understand, to understand your markets, which is really what a business does. And that's really right. But unfortunately, many of those existing people have built their careers on trying to be the people who build out those, those models. But when you have benchmarking and standardization of the model, which is what the regs are, are forcing you to do, you need to have tools like this that enable that, that homogenizes it, and then your benefits go to how smart can you be in allocating your resources, i.e. allocating your risk to the highest value return. Okay, So then, Therefore, the next steps is obviously just to build out the statistical and analytical capabilities of these tools, building on the systemic uh, risk metrics. Think, uh, again, that's, a, that's something that we build out. Uh, we've been working with a, a lot of the IEEE folks, and the, it's interesting how the engineers have really been very interested in, the, in these tools and their applications. And then realizing this does have to be a partnership between regulators and market participants and, and academics. And I think being, once you understand that, pool, pooling anonymized data becomes really an important step for us being able to test which regulations are going to have which effect before we, now that we're unroll, what, pulling back many of the regs that we're doing, again, in an arbitrary way, it, we could have, again, adverse effects and be in perhaps even worse position than where we were now, right? So these are some of the tools that I think will be, will be helpful moving on. All right. Professor yeah. Howard, I want to I focus on that piece of what you just said in the dialogue with the banks, because many people in this room have lived through that at least once in the course of the last quarter century. Uh, sometimes on the side which felt it was being commoditized unduly, but if I, I look around the room at the most successful of my corporate 
uh, friends here, they, they, commoditization was their business um, mm -hmm. because, of course, uh, commoditizing other people's businesses was good for them. I do not understand exactly how that dialogue concludes when you say to people, well, now we will commoditize what you used to regard as very strategically important assets and therefore you will go back to making virtuous decisions about which part of your business is really important to you. Hey. I wish you would tell me just a little more about what they say back. Well, they keep saying, well, we don't want to buy your product. I say, well, good, because I'm not selling it. <laughs> yeah, we've been there, done that. How many people in the room? Uh, yeah. So, so once they realize that you're not selling something and you're actually providing a public good, the question then becomes, okay, how then do they start thinking about this in a way that makes sense for each of the different subsections that they participate in. For example, in Arcadia Soft with the, with the need to collateralize on the, um, the clearing houses and the setting of the initial margins, that's a very complex problem. And that is that they've started pooling using, using these different consortiums to be able to start calculating that out. They want to be able to do that not only for themselves, but they want to pass that down to their their clients. However, they're realizing that's a very uh, risky thing for them to do. So does that mean that we don't provide clearing for clients like that? Well, no, obviously not. That means that they're going to get out of that business. It becomes standardized. And there's a way for us to start thinking about it, which is through these types of tools. They may underwrite and think about whether they underwrite in a strategic way, but they're not necessarily going to provide the models as to how to calculate that particular margin and try and compete with it, a market. So then I think I, I, I think I can put against common experience here. Years ago, one of the very largest of our uh, IT industry friends um, had a constant compliance problem with free software licensing. They, mm -hmm. they were buying a lot of companies and they had many, many business units and oddly enough, they were never in control of all their business units and there were more non-compliant products than there were compliant products. Mm -hmm. And we moved into fix a bug, make a bug situation with them and it, and eventually they made the one true mistake they put GPL software in the middle of their flagship product mm -hmm. uh, and denied that it was there and then we said no look again no it isn't there yes it is we see it we make it we know it oh you're right and it became possible to have a moment of truth at which we said okay well here here's the good news we're never going to sue you about this you're going to hire all the people who work on the project to be your consultants and you're going to fix everything mm -hmm. And this time it finally got through and they did wonderful engineering and they went from zero to hero very fast. And we said, great, why don't you roll that out as a product now? Why don't you, why don't you, you have this great operations focused compliance machinery. Why don't, why don't you sell that as a product? You, you, you have a, a venture capital organization chained to your ankle. Why don't, you, why don't you just go and do all this? And it went all the way up to the top and the business decided, no, now that we are really good at compliance, we think that's a competitive advantage for us. We would never share it with anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what you just said was the way you solve that problem is by playing off organizations within the organization against one another. Uh, you subgroup will have a competitive advantage from making more community-based risk assessment. You other subgroup over here, trains leaving the station, you better get aboard. Did I hear it right? Yes, see, because right now the way that the way the regs are written is that when there is a, a competition, a, a common pools problem within the organization, and they compete with each other over the risk. And who gets to actually make investments? Because when you do a counterparty trade, a trade on the counterparty, you don't get to um, offset it like you used to with, a, with when you have a derivative or something, as a piece of insurance that would go back on it. And therefore, you actually are competing very viciously with your own you know, colleagues or your own subdivisions. And so that leads to a very different type of strategy taking place. Suppose we shot the moon here and we tried to wish into existence regulations that would require the institutions to use common or standard risk assessment models. Mm -hmm. 
I, I assume that, that Goldman Sachs would turn out to have a little in with government, and it would be very hard to get that through Gary Cohn, and maybe you know, the Senate wouldn't approve it and so on. But, but would it make sense for us as a community of people trying to limit systemic financial risk in our society to require that people standardize their risk assessment so models I don't, in these ways? I don't even, ha given this, I don't need them to, to show me their models at all. All I need is that we can, I take their results, they take, uh, the Fed looks at their results, we run it through a same common model, and then we can say how we deviate. And on basis on that, you can then converge. You don't need to show models, basically. And then that's, that's fine. I mean, so if you don't want to have a quote unquote standard model, you can at least have a standard way to evaluate the outcomes of it. So um, that, that was how we should have done it. We, we, we should have said, Microsoft doesn't have to show us the source code. We just have to count bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's true. We would have won hands down. Mm -hmm. um, questions uh, from the floor? Sure. Yeah, so um, let's say that I am OK with these financial institutions collecting all of this data. I don't think they're going to have data breaches, mm -hmm. let's just say. Um, I'm also okay with behavioral data, health data, um, purchase history, et cetera, being correlated by them. Let's say I also believe that the models that the risk is based on are accurate and somewhat democratic or whatever term we're going to use. We would still have the problem, it seems to me at least, with anonymity of the data set. Because we know from large data sets, especially when there's a lot of data points, when things are correlated, they're easily de-anonymized. And on top of that, just re real quick, I don't mean to cut you off, but no. um, we also know that when um, big data knows that they're able to say something's anonymous, they tend to be incentivized to collect more. Mm -hmm. So to me, those two problems would still exist, even if all those other problems are solved. Right, so that's a really good place for academics to come in. That's why you want a third party like an academic institution to be that's invested in the research component of it and not commercializing it. That's why you really need a partnership like that. And the, the, the risk that I'm talking about is not on like the credit risk, like individual credit risk. This is the output of their, their P&L statements, all of the, the counterparty statements and all of that type of stuff. I mean, but you, your, your, your statement still holds that you can figure out which institution, if you keep digging and digging. But if you work with a, like a, an institution that doesn't have that vested interest or, is, or has the obligation to work in a public goods way, that's, that's, a, that's why you want that. Yeah. That's why I'm giving it away. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's how we always felt. I, I, I think. Um, uh, all right, so don't go away, okay. and let's uh, and let's richen the conversation a little more. So, um, uh, uh, occasionally, as you know, we, we 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 like to have people who know a lot because they work in wonderful places, but they don't necessarily need to be speaking on behalf of their places. And the uh, places they're not speaking on behalf of are often banks and <laughs> things like that for reasons we've just finished. So, 